Hello, everybody. Let me get us started. Uh, I'm Chris Schrader, and uh, I'm delighted to have you here today to join in a conversation uh, sponsored by the program in public law about uh, politics and policy in Washington, why Congress isn't working as well as it ought to, why it seems so dysfunctional. We've got um, a couple of very distinguished uh, commentators on that topic for us today. First, former Senator Ted Kaufman from uh, the good state of Delaware. He, he filled the last two years of uh, Vice President Biden's term in the Senate when he was uh, appointed by the governor of Delaware to do that. For 22 years, Ted had been the chief of staff of then Senator Biden. Uh, at, was asked by the then 29-year-old senator-elect to go down to Washington to help him, Senator Biden, set up his office, and 22 years later was able to leave that position. <laughs> uh, before then, he had been working uh, for DuPont. Before that, he had gotten an undergraduate an engineering degree from this fine institution and a degree from Wharton, uh, one of the most well-respected uh, chiefs of staff uh, still legendary among the people who uh, are the long timers in the Senate, and uh, a very distinguished uh, career as the senator from Delaware. So it's great to have him here today. And with him is uh, Jeff Peck. Uh, Jeff uh, worked for Ted and Senator Biden for a number of years, including five as staff director of the Senate Judiciary Committee. He then left to work for Arthur Anderson. He is now the managing partner of a lobbying firm in Washington, uh, Peck, Madigan, and Jones, which, is, which employs roughly an equal number of Democrats and Republicans. And uh, I myself have spent a little time working for Senator Biden back in the day uh, as chief counsel of the Senate Judiciary Committee. So I thought I'd get us started by just uh, reminding ourselves of uh, some of the facts about uh, the state of play in, in Washington and, and particularly the public's opinion of that state of play. Gridlock, dysfunction. <laughs> yes. So the uh, Gallup and a number of other polling organizations asked the question about uh, uh, whether you approve of the job that Congress is doing. Uh, uh, Gallup's goes back uh, decades. These are just some numbers from the more recent years. And you can see from a blip in the era of good feeling right after the Obama administration came in and lots of Democrats had won uh, positions in the Congress. And I guess momentarily we were feeling good about the place. We have passed the Lilly Ledbetter Act. and. The stimulus package passed. Uh, people may forget, but at the time, it looked like that was uh, an intervention that the government needed to make in the economy. Since then, it's been nothing but uh, low numbers until it reached 9 percent approval in uh, the end of 2013, which is an historic low for Gallup. They've never pulled a lower number than that. And that's just another set of numbers uh, aggregating lots of different uh, polls from the, roughly the same period with the disapproval numbers uh, and approval numbers going in the predictable directions. And this is the answer to the most recent Gallup inquiry in January, 16 percent approve. I always wonder who those 16 percent are when I see some number like that. Um, 81 <laughs> disapprove and just a few have no opinion. So some of the uh, peel away some layer of the onion, why do people have that feeling? Well, you can ask some questions about uh, what their reaction is to various descriptors of, of the Congress. And you get these kinds of numbers, 80 percent think they're out of touch with the average person, 84, 85 percent think that special interests heavily influence them as opposed to the public interest. Um, Roughly the same number think they're mainly interested in re-election as opposed to doing anything for the good of the country. And a handful of people still think that members are honest, but not very, member, not, not very many. Um, 
public policy polling, which is a, uh, which is a Raleigh based polling organization, <laughs> likes to ask uh, unorthodox questions from time to time. So they asked one recently to compare your favorability rating of Congress with a number of other institutions or entities, and they got these kind of numbers. <laughs> Do you have a higher opinion of Congress or of the IRS? The IRS wins. Wall Street, this is very interesting. Uh, Congress loses to cockroaches by two percentage points. But the good news is uh, they're still way ahead of Vladimir Putin. Um, and hemorrhoids, I think, they also beat out, but, but not by much. Um, so this, all of this is um, reflective, I think, of a certain uh, absence of positive feeling towards what's happening in D.C. these days. And when we talk about this general issue of congressional dysfunction, which we do uh, in our class, the Duke and D.C. class that we teach, as well as to other groups, Deb, if you hear this, if you can help me turn this projector off, I'm having trouble doing it from up here. That would be very helpful to me. It's off. It's off. Ah, she's a magician. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted something to write on because I thought we thought we would, uh, as I said, when we talk about this topic with other groups, we always find out. <laughs> <laughs> that there are lots of opinions about what's wrong with the way Congress operates today and how to make it better. So we thought we would crowdsource this part of the presentation and ask you to give us... Um, well, let's do it this way. So take this sentence. Congress would do a better job addressing the nation's problems if... And just fill in that blank. So let me just, uh, no, there, I bet you none of you will give us a wrong answer to this question. And, but then we want to talk about uh, answers after we've gotten a number out on the table. Some we think may go deeper to the hearts of the problem than others. But let's see, what, let's see how we do. So Congress would do a better job of addressing the nation's problems if. If elections were publicly financed. I'm sorry? If elections were publicly financed. I'm sorry, I still didn't quite hear it. If elections were publicly financed. Public finance of elections, great. <clears throat> okay, someone else? Yeah. Less gerrymandering of safe districts for different parties. extreme political factions from the mainstream so that they don't carry the rest of the party with them. How would we do that? Slavery? What, what would we do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't necessarily have an answer for it, but I think that it's more part <laughs> Maybe enclaves of extremism could elect a few people to the Congress? I mean, there are several solutions. You could argue that having the bicameral electorate is a problem, or the fact that we only have two main parties. I mean, a plurality system might be a solution. I think there are a lot of arguments for it. But the bottom line is there needs to be a way to distinguish the extreme factions of political parties from the more mainstream. Okay, so. Distinguish the extremes from the mainstream. Okay. Another one? Anybody else? Yeah. Term, term limits. Term limits? Oops. Just keep trying various instruments <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that. No dividing 
government. <laughs> Reduce the amount of time there in session. Reduce the amount of time there in session. That was Senator Eastland's solution. He thought the whole country went to hell in a handbasket when Washington got air conditioning. People <laughs> stayed around longer. Reduce the amount of time there in session. Read a lot of the press criticizing the Congress. That's more the more common critique is the opposite that there aren't enough legislative work days and people are taking two and a half day work weeks and so on. Yeah, the press would uh, investigate an issue in depth rather than just cursorily discussing it. So higher quality reporting yeah. of issues. <coughs> Okay. Anyone else? Um, if more voters read the quality, whatever quality reporting is out there, <laughs> better informed voters. Ah, there we go. <laughs> okay, better informed voters. Yes, sir. Um, I'm not completely clear on this, but I believe there's like an equal time requirement for the press that if they're going to cover one side, they have to give equal time to the other or something like yeah, that? Yeah, it used to be, but we got rid of that. <laughs> the, fair, the fairness doctrine? Yeah. Yeah. But the idea that the press covers that, continues to cover one yeah. on one side and the other side, never picking who's good and who's bad. That's, that's what that's basically what you're saying. Right. They're not compelled <laughs> to do that, but there's right. a tendency of a lot of reporting to do on they the one hand and on the other hand. They want to appear objective, therefore they give both sides of the story when really there's only one side of the story. I'll put objective reporting in quotes. Right. Anyone else? This is a great list. Yeah. They were first past the post. So proportional maybe? Proportional yeah. representation? Our voting? Instead of proportional uh, ranked choice voting. Okay, so our alternative, basically, to <coughs> California is experimenting with this, I think. And Minnesota and Oregon, I think. Okay. Yes, sir. All the way to a parliamentary system. Ah. Abolish the Constitution. <laughs> 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 Tweak it. Okay. So pretty, yep. Yeah. New back earmarks. Ah. First earmarks were for universities, Boston University to be specific, to created the whole enterprise of targeted grants. Someone else? That's a good list. That's a good list. Yeah. Get rid of the Hastert rule in the House. Everybody know what that is? That's the informal rule that uh, the Republican Party won't bring, the leadership won't bring a vote to the floor unless it's get, re supported by a majority of the Republican caucus. You need a majority of the majority <laughs> to get a, uh, a vote on the floor. This is what enables Democrats to say, if you put the Senate's immigration bill on the floor of the House today, it would pass because it could cobble together enough Democrats and enough Republicans to pass. But it won't be brought to the floor as long as only a minority of a Republican, the Republican caucus is for it. And it is, it is an informal rule. It is not in the House rules themselves. Yeah, Denny Hastert says it's not even his rule. So. <laughs> <laughs> but he lives with it. <clears throat> okay, so this is great. Um, this is a really good list. Some of it you can even see. 
<laughs> Maybe while I ask uh, Senator Kaufman to react to any part of it that he wants to, I will uh, write over some of it so you can actually see all of it by the time we're done. Well, let me start with the, kind of in the order that they were presented. Um, one of the problems uh, that we believe goes on, and I see a bunch of our people that have heard this before, uh, and thanks for coming. Uh, <laughs> is that we believe that there's a, there's a real misunderstanding a lot about what goes on in Congress, about the way the Congress functions. Uh, we believe that there are problems with the way it's recovered. We believe that when you look at the public perception, there's a lot of things wrong. So some of the things up here, I think we're going we're to say, nah, I don't think that's really one of the problems. But, oh, can you hear, can you hear me in the back? Yeah, it's they can hear me. It's they can hear me. People who might look at the webcast later on and we need that. Oh, okay. Thanks. So anyway, what, what, why don't we go through some of these and just kind of talk about them, and Jeff and Chris will, will jump in. Uh, but let's talk about the one that I think is the single most truthful non-myth on the board. So we'll start going against counter our <coughs> theory, but I think it's so, and that is public financing of elections. Now, if there's one thing that we could do in this country to improve the quality <coughs> of our government, it would be to have public financing of elections. I've said ever since practically I arrived in Washington in 1973 with Senator Biden, and he and I both agreed that if there we were made, you couldn't do it as president, but if you made the czar of the universe, the number one thing you do is have public financing campaigns. And it, and it isn't because uh, of what I think the popular perception is, which is that uh, people are taking money for votes, what's called quid pro quo. I mean, there's a lot of feeling in the public. How many, how many people here think that member, there are members of Congress out there who are being influenced by their vote because someone comes in to them and says, hey, Chris, I'll give $10,000 to your campaign if you'll go out and vote this way on this bill. How many people think that's going on? You know, this, usually it's a, a much larger group. I, I don't believe that's happening. I, I don't believe there's members of Congress who people come into them and say, like the National Rifle Association. The National Rifle Association, I, I think the pot's that fair to say, is the National Rifle Association be one of those, or how many people think the National Rifle Association be one of those kinds of organizations? Yeah, I mean, it has a reputation of it. Well, National Rifle Association's power does not, doesn't come from money, it comes from the fact that they have so many supporters that are willing to vote for a candidate in terms of based on just one issue, and that is guns. They don't care about anything else. So if you come to them and you say, I agree with you on 90% of the things, but you don't get in the guns, I'm not voting for you. And that's one of the reasons why Hannah has to have money. Here's, the, here's where the corruption comes and why we should change public financing campaigns, in my opinion. And that's what we're going to do is just give you our opinion of these things. And that is, if Jeff gets up one morning, <clears throat> he wants to run for the United States Senate, and he believes that what's really important for this country is that we help the poor, poor disadvantaged, we do something about inequality in this country, we believe that we have to increase taxes on the wealthy in order to pay for what we're going to need. And Chris gets up the same morning and says, I'm going to run for the Senate against Jeff. And I believe, I generally believe, this is not something I'm doing, I generally believe we have to reduce the capital gains tax, we've got to reduce taxes, we've got to do away with the state taxes, and we have to do away with the corporate income tax. Okay? So you've got two candidates here, both who absolutely totally believe, for the, for the state of this argument, <coughs> absolutely believe what they say. Who's going who's to get the most money? Mm -hmm. I mean, is it even going to be close? That's what goes on. That's why we need public finance campaigns. Not because people are doing quid pro quos, but because of the fact that if, in fact, you have a position that you genuinely hold, <coughs> which will generate money for you, you have a big leg up on the person who goes to, who wants to go out and raise money for something else. Is the point I'm making on this thing? So that's really so. That's why we need to do. We should have uh, a public. Finance. And it would also help. Um, you know, many of you are probably familiar with the Citizens United case and a follow-up decision in the D.C. Circuit, which basically allowed for the creation of these so-called super PACs, which in a lot of ways have replaced the power of the parties. Um, not that the 
you know, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party don't raise money. They do raise money. But what they're able to do is dwarf these days by super PACs, some of which have, under the rules, uh, the donors need to be disclosed, and, and some of whom the donors don't need to be disclosed, who pour a tremendous amount of money into advertising you see in different elections, whether it's presidential, whether it's gubernatorial, whether it's state, whether it's Senate, whether it's House. Uh, very often, the most amount of money that's spent in that election is from a super PAC, and the super PAC is funded by people who are outside of the state and won't even be voting in that particular state as it is. Yeah, and, and see, they, they, I, as you all, I mean, law students, you know, I mean, it's, 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 public finance campaign is essentially impossible <coughs> based on the Supreme Court, uh, uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court uh, decisions. Uh, but you have, now you have, I mean, the Supreme Court decisions are basically, the standard for years was whether it's a corrupt act, whether it encourages corruption. <coughs> Justice Kennedy said that uh, uh, there's a fellow named Norm Weinstein that works at the American Enterprise Institute, I don't know. Actually, on the Congress and what goes on in Washington, and he responded to Supreme Court Justice Kennedy's uh, statement that this was not going to increase corruption in the system. As what planet is he on? <laughs> because what happens is now the money just pours in, and and it isn't it isn't like a Democrat or Republican problem. I mean, the biggest problem where it showed itself in the most amazing way was what Mitt Romney did to Newt Gingrich in the Florida primary, where. New Cambridge had come out and done well, and, uh, um, and he was on top. His numbers were great, and then because of the super PACs, people who uh, were supposed to be independent around me, they just carpet bombed Gingrich in Florida, and that was the end of Gingrich. So it, it, it isn't just like it affects, it affects Democrats or Republicans. In fact, basically right now, most of the Republican political uh, uh, super PACs are having trouble raising money because the feeling is they spent $400 million in the presidential race, and... Romney lost. <clears throat> so uh, the public finance campaign is one of the is, is one of the issues up there that really is um, uh, is one where I think you're 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 absolutely uh, absolutely on point. Jeff, you want to take one? Yeah. The um, you know I guess I'm uh, I'll take on term limits. Um, because it's always been a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, um, in that I, I'm not a believer in term limits. I think there is a real, um, I mean, I totally understand the argument and the point of view that, you know, look, if you're not, if you don't have to run for re-election, you're more independent, you're less susceptible to influence by special interests, you're less susceptible to uh, contributions, that sort of thing. You can exercise a more independent uh, role, be more of a trustee, if you will, as opposed to a... Uh, as to a delegate, but I do think that there is um, a real advantage uh, that I've seen both working on the Hill and then being someone who's often from trying to get folks on the Hill with people having experience. Uh, that experience comes in from expertise built up on substantive issues. Um, you know, take Senator Biden, for example, uh, got on the Judiciary Committee and the Foreign Relations Committee, ended up being the chairman of both, and over time uh, became a real. Uh, nationally and international, internationally recognized expert on a range of foreign policy issues. And foreign policy issues, you gain that knowledge and, and, uh, and expertise from experience. Very hard to, you know, to, to really learn uh, about the intricate details of how foreign relations operate and what motivates what leaders and that sort of thing if you're only doing it for two or three years. So I think there is a real advantage to be gained uh, by experience, and I think in the end, to me, there are term limits, and there are elections, uh, and people who, um, you know, if the voters decide that someone, uh, that their member of Congress or their senator shouldn't be there any longer, they have the ability to vote that person out and, in effect, impose a term limit uh, through the election. So, you know, I think term limits very often um, uh, are touted as kind of a great solution. My own view is, and again, as Ted said, these are just our opinions, is it doesn't work as uh, quite as well as uh, as it might in theory. Yeah, and, and the other thing is, uh, <laughs> the basic thesis behind term limits, correct me if, you're, if you think I'm wrong, is members are just out of touch. They go to Washington, they get lost. Uh, most of the polling shows that people think that people go to Congress, good people, that they get corrupted by the system. So the whole approach, is that fair to say to people that term limits is because they feel the elected officials are out of touch. They've just been eaten up by Washington. Right? 
There's a wonderful book out that we used to use in a, in a course that Chris and I have been teaching and Jeff has been involved in for 20 years, and that is, it's called Running Scared. The basic thesis, uh, the, the writer of the book, went back and looked at three members of uh, parliamentary systems around the world, one in, one in um, Germany and one in France. U.S. U.S. Yes, well, that's right, U.S. compared with the U.S. <clears throat> and his, his basic thesis was that in, in the United States, Steny Hoyer, who was the, uh, uh, the Congress person he picked, who's now the number two person in the House, uh, had 13 elections like in, what, six years? And uh, in Germany, they had one, and in the um, uh, U.K., I think they had two. And his basic thesis is one of the problems is that, that members of Congress in the United States are too much in touch. Essentially, they care too much about what everybody thinks. The problem is not that they're out of touch. The problem is they're too in touch. We have elected officials who they're, I mean, right now, we're going to get to gerrymandering, but there's very few districts in this country right now in Congress that are even, uh, uh, there's going to be a race in. I think, what, it was like 30 now we have or something out of 435 or things that we race. And even in those races, the, the perception of people is that uh, the members are too attentive to uh, to what the electorate thinks. Now, the other thing is the standard question I've asked recently <coughs> to people about um, term limits is, if you look back on our recent problems where the numbers, as Chris has presented, have gone in the toilet, uh, if you think about it, was it the new members of Congress or the old members of Congress that caused the problem? <laughs> I've not had anybody yet come up to me and say it's the old members. So the idea that we're going to do away with the with the with the uh, 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 the old members, and let me tell you, it's scary when you see like the number of old members. In other words, there might be even more inmates running the assembly. Exactly. Well, we have the staff. By the way, as a as a, as a twenty two year twenty two year staff person, I'd be running the Congress. The staff people bring in new members and roll them over that fast, and the staff will be running the Congress. Trust me, because it is, it is extraordinarily complex. I just, and the people that have, that have taken our class in Washington, our DC class, will tell you they've heard this before, but um, go to a hearing. Turn on C-SPAN. Okay, don't turn on C-SPAN when it's showing on the floor when no one's on the floor and someone's just speaking because the floor is the place of record. And actually go out and, 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 and turn on the TV sometime and watch a congressional hearing. And I'm not talking about one immigration reform or, you know, one of the hot issues, uh, Benghazi or, you know, where then you're seeing a totally different show. But just pick, if you can, a, bore, a more boring one. I, I was, after I'd been in the Senate for, for, for a year, the majority leader, Harry Reid, came and said to me, would, would you, on two committees, I, I, I only picked two committees on purpose because most members have two committees, but I want to really concentrate on the two committees. Senator Biden only had two committees, and for the, most of the time he was in the Senate, it worked out very well. Most members of Congress are on four or five committees, which is another problem. But he came and said, would you serve on the Homeland Security Committee? If I was on Judiciary and Foreign Relations, and I said, yeah, okay, I'll serve on Homeland Security. Then he asked me to serve on Armed Services. I said, okay, I'll serve on Armed Services. Then he asked me if I'd serve on Budget, and I said, no. <laughs> but I went to the first Homeland Security meeting, and the chair was, was uh, Senator Lieberman from Connecticut, and the Republican was Susan Collins. And they were dealing with Homeland Security. They called Homeland Security. It used to be all the, gov the old Government Affairs Committee, and it covers all how the government functions. And, you know, they had four or five people come to testify about something that was going on in the federal government. I don't think I ever really figured out what it was. But I was there. I spent 22 years in the Senate. I educated Chris and I. As I said, we took this course for 20 years. I didn't understand 60% went on for the first 20 minutes. And when you think about the federal government, how incredibly complex it is, I mean, to compare it to when Eastland was here, you know, I mean, we're now the most powerful political, uh, political, military, economic country on the face of the earth and in history. Just think about the foreign policy, foreign national security problems compared to what it was when John Kennedy was president. We are all. If we don't get involved, nobody does anything. And in Europe right now, they're right now. Oh, man, what are we going to do? American national leadership. They're going to turn to Asia. The complexity of the federal government is absolutely incredible. 
So the, the idea that we're going to bring in new people, sit them down, and run a government is complex to government. It's really scary this time because when you look at the people who are leaving the, 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 the Congress, the Senate in particular this time, it is, it is, too, it is too scary. So let me, uh, let me pick up on this notion of separating the extremes from the uh, mainstream and also gerrymandering. Um, there's increasing evidence that uh, as a country, we've, we've been sorting ourselves into political parties for a long time. The parties today are more homogenous within themselves and farther apart as between the two uh, than almost any other time in the nation's history. A consequence of that is if you self-identify as a Democrat or if you self-identify as a Republican, you're going to vote for the person who wears that party label in the next election because the odds that the person who's wearing the other hat is closer to you than somebody who's from your own affiliated group is very small. So a moderate Republican is going to vote for a conservative Republican sooner than that person will vote for a moderate Democrat because of the spread between the parties. So that produces the phenomenon that the, this uh, Anthony King book and Running Scared was, was talking about even 20 years ago that oftentimes the critical election for any member of Congress is the primary. Because that's where you have to, that's where you fight out who's going to wear the party label. So if you're in a Republican district, the most important election to you is the Republican primary. What's the characteristic of primaries? Very few people vote in them. They are dominated by the extremes on the left and the right, the activists, if you don't want to choose a gentler label than extremes, the activists, the people who are really concerned about the issues, will come out and vote in primaries. And look at any member of Congress who's been in an incumbent for a long period of time. What is it that he or she fears most? It's that she'll be challenged if she's a Democrat from the left in the Democratic primary or from the right in the Republican primary. This, this may affect how that member votes, because you don't want to get on the wrong side of activist groups too often, because uh, you don't want to give people the ammunition to mount that primary challenge. But it certainly affects the composition of people who then get elected, because as long as there's an activist element in the party, that person is always going to be able to mount a, a substantial challenge uh, when and if the time is right. So that's, that's why if you look at the, the the rankings of members of Congress on conservative and, and liberal scales over the last 20 years, you see the Democratic Party moving more and more to the liberal end of the spectrum and the Republicans moving more and more to the right because every time there's a cleansing election, it produces people of these more homogenous, uh, in these homogenous parties, it produces people of who appeal more to the activist elements in those parties than to the mainstream. So this lesson that we all learned in political science classes about how in a two-party election, uh, as Ralph Nader said when he was running for president, that the difference between the two parties is just Tweedledum and Tweedledee because everybody's commit, uh, campaigning for that median voter, that, that voter who sits right in the center. So if you can peel off that person, you'll get the 51% it takes to win. That doesn't appear, that's not the phenomenon we're observing as a matter of election politics these days. We're observing people who are able to take extreme policy positions and run no risk of being defeated in the general election because of this sorting phenomenon. And let me I'll give you an example of how this really plays out today and will throughout the next six months. The question of immigration reform. House Republicans. There's really sort of three, I'm not going to oversimplify it all, there's basically three groups of views on what House Republicans on immigration. There's a group of people who actually want to do it and are willing to support and personally would support a path to citizenship. That number privately is greater than the number we're willing to state it publicly, by the way. There's a second group who would like to vote for it but are basically afraid to vote for it. And the reason they're afraid to vote for it is because they're afraid of a primary challenge that Chris is talking about. And there's a third group that wouldn't support immigration reform under any possible circumstance whatsoever. And much of what's going on in the House uh, right now among Republican rank and file and their leadership is the question of what immigration reform could we do and equally important, when can we do it? 
and the timing is being dictated by the calendar of Republican primaries. Both Republican House primaries will be completed by mid-May, end of May, beginning of June. And therefore, to the extent they're going to move anything on immigration other than border security, they're going to do it after, the, after their primary filing dates have been passed. Not necessarily even after the primary, but after the primary date has passed so that they know they're not going to be challenged from the right. So, you know, this, this is, I think these are important points that Chris is making, and they, today they have an incredible day-to-day -day impact on the reality of what actually happens, particularly in the House. Now, when you talk about gerrymandering, there was a period of time in which most people, including a lot of political science literature, thought the, the creation of these safe districts <coughs> was fundamentally a phenomenon of gerrymandering, of whoever had the control of the state legislature immediately after the decennial uh, census would power up a supercomputer and figure out how to manipulate the electorate into boxes so that they would maximize the opportunities for their own party. Increasingly, the analysis seems to suggest that the greater effect is simply caused by geographical sorting. The Democrats have become an urban, northeastern, and west coast party, and the Republicans have become a rural, exurb, western, and midwestern party. And it's some people have run these hypothetical uh, computer maps on states in which they tried to be straight up in creating districts. That is, they would look at con continuity and compactness and contiguousness and all the factors that you think ought to go into a, a non-politicized um, setting of congressional districts. And they came up with districts that, that in their composition looked roughly as safe <laughs> as the so-called gerrymandered districts do now. It's, be it's because that of this uh, geographic sorting that's occurring. Another evidence of that is that the Senate seats, a large number of Senate seats today are essentially safe. And that can't be a product of gerrymandering because that's a statewide electorate uh, voting for the United States Senate. So it's not obvious how you, how you uh, crack this particular problem. One suggestion that people have proposed is these alternatives to first pass the post voting uh, so that you figure out Proportional representation is very common in, the, in a number of European uh, countries, probably much more common, actually, than first past the post. The problem in the United States is it's incredibly difficult to stand up a third party. I mean, the, the PR works in states, in, in uh, nations where there are multiple parties, and you want to um, ensure that the, there's representation of the Greens, and there's representation of the Socialists, and there's representation of the the ultra-conservatives, and so on. It's not clear what structural changes would have to be done or could be feasibly done to create viable third parties in the United States. Until, until that happens, at least with respect to PR voting, it's not clear what uh, impact that could have at the congressional level. Charlie Cook, has a, uh, who's a reporter in town, and the people have had this class before know what he say. Charlie Cook has a theory. He says there's not a congressional district in America that has a Whole Foods and a Cracker Barrel in it. <laughs> It's not quite true, but it makes the point. Yeah. The other thing is, if you ever want to see the Democratic vote in America, get on an airplane, fly from coast to coast. Wherever you see the lights, that's where the Democrats are. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that from a lay. I'm just saying this. It's the cities. It, it's incredibly difficult to do it with the cities uh, where the Democrats so concentrated in metropolitan areas and Republicans so involved in, uh, in, uh, in rural areas. There's the final thing I'll say about um, th th this uh, geographical sorting that's going on. And that's in the context of an uh, article I just read out of the American Political Science Association study on trying to reach better negotiated s settlements in um, uh, compromises in uh, Washington. And one of the analyses argued that for the past 30 years, we've all heard this aphorism, we've essentially been a 50-50 nation, relatively evenly divided with a majority ship in both the House and the Senate changing hands a number of times over that period of time. But the electorate as a whole, looking at a whole bunch of metrics, is relatively evenly divided. This is actually unique in American history. The only comparable period of time that was found that resembled this kind of 50-50 balance was back at the, uh, in the uh, 1880s to the, the turn of the century. 
Most of the time in American politics, there has been a dominant party. What is the consequence of it being a 50-50 nation? Well, in every election, there is a whole lot up, at for, stake, up for grabs. Because minor, minority status is not as much fun as majority status if you are trying to drive an agenda. When the Democrats had control of the House for a 40-year period that ended in 1994, the aphorism around the House of Representatives is you would rather be a, de a Democratic staffer than a Republican member, by a long shot. So if one reason we have seen ugly elections is that elections in the current period are terribly consequential. We have got these two parties with rather distinct social uh, and, and uh, programmatic philosophies. Each of them thinks there is a really good chance for them to garner control and, and hence have the, the, the operating momentum on their side in any particular election. That tends to make elections that have a lot of stake no holds barred even more than they usually are. So a lot of the, a lot of the money that is flowing into elections flows into those districts and those states where people think they can flip a seat, whether it is in the Senate or the House. This is happening at the state level, too. Where in the last North Carolina election, a lot of money came into the state or was here through, the, through some um, North, Carolinian, North Carolina residents was able to, by strategically spending a fair amount of money throughout the state, flip both the House and the Senate from Democrat to Republican. So that phenomenon is going on uh, at the same time as the, the, the policy positions of the two parties uh, seems to be fairly far apart. Let me, uh, let me take on the, the question of earmarks um, and, and the notion of bringing them back, which was not uh, a comment I have expected to hear uh, today, and I find it very interesting. I give you just a couple of thoughts on earmarks. Um, I mean, I've been in the lobbying business in one capacity or another for 20 years. I've never lobbied for an earmark. Uh, I've never had a client ask me for a lobby to lobby for an earmark, and I never had any interest in lobbying for it because it seems so uh, kind of transactional and non-policy oriented. Mm -hmm. And it got to a point, I think, where uh, there was tremendous abuse in earmarks, and if anything, gave people a feeling that uh, government was federal money was being wasted. It was the so-called bridge to nowhere in Alaska. And I think if there's anything that made people feel like there was a quid pro quo going on, I give money to this member and all of a sudden, you know, I get a special project from the government. It was earmarked. So I think there was a tremendous amount of abuse. Two things I didn't realize, though, uh, about the consequences or didn't anticipate in terms of the consequences of getting rid of earmarks. Number one, uh, some earmarks are actually good. Uh, for example, my, or my favorite example is Kevlar saved a lot of lives over the course of the last however many years since it was um, uh, created and, and sort of produced for, for police officers and members of the military. Kevlar got its start as an earmark. No, it's not any more complicated than that. It was a government earmark that really got the research going and led to the development of Kevlar. Uh, two, um, and this ties back to the point uh, somebody made about um, you know, separating the extremes from the mainstream. Earmarks, uh, the ability to have earmarks are an incredible behavior enforcement tool that the leadership has. So, for example, what I mean by that is in the House of Representatives today, one of the reasons that Speaker Boehner can't really control uh, the far right of his caucus is he doesn't really have the ability to threaten anything or withhold anything. In the old days when you had earmarks, and let's say you know you had a conservative member who really, really needed roads uh, rebuilt in his district or her district or a bridge rebuilt. You knew that if you uh, if you really took on the speaker, one way or another, the speaker was going to find a way to make sure your district, through the appropriations bill, did not get the money uh, that was necessary for that bridge or road that you had promised you would deliver in your last election. Uh, so earmarks were critical in terms of people getting along and working together. And, and it's not the only reason that the Speaker can't influence this extreme faction of folks in the Tea Party. Uh, some of them don't care about re-election. Some of them are just are, uh, you know, they're so committed to their views and beliefs and principles that none of these external factors could really influence them. But you lose a great ability uh, through the negotiating process that occurs within each party or within each caucus in the Senate, in the House, by getting rid of them. So, you know, like a lot of things, there was a huge amount of abuse. The pendulum has swung back all the way to no earmarks, uh, and probably there's a sensible balance in there with more controls that would allow earmarks to go through some very transparent 
you know, extreme disclosure mode, but still not get rid of them entirely. Yeah, earmarks, the, the, the big, first off, earmarks are incredibly ugly to watch it happen. I mean, we're going to talk a little bit about one of the problems with the Congress. Watching members of Congress say, I'll give you an earmark for $200,000 for $200 million for a building you want in your district, if you'll give me $100 million for a building I want in my district, is not something that's going to raise anybody's view about how great the Congress is. Second thing is, it's really, one of the reasons why the Congress is not corrupt in a, in a sense that people are taking money for bribes is there's not much you could do in the Congress where someone really can make money bang right after what you do. You don't have a lot more power. If you want to make money and be corrupt in government, you want to be the county council person that does the zoning. You know, you got a, a piece of property that's worth a, a million dollars, and you give it a commercial zoning now worth ten million dollars. Uh, some not probably that nine million dollars is going to end up in somebody's pocket. Trust me. And the reason why we had the Jack Abramoff thing was because of earmarks. Because for the first time, someone could go to a member of Congress and say, if, at universities, by universities. Go to, go to, someone would go to a university in the, in, the, in the realm of this, and there's loads of books been written on it. They go to university, uh, um, Jackson U, and they say, look, you want a new $5 million facility to do research on such and such and such and such? You give me $500,000, and I will get it for you. You give me 10 percent. Then they go to a member of Congress, and they say to a member of Congress, if you give me this earmark, I'll give you $50,000. That's how it works. You can't do that on anything else in the Congress. So earmarks, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I don't believe much in earmarks because of the effect it has in the Congress and the rest of it. In terms of getting things done, we've had a powerful Congresses in the past where members have it long before we had uh, at earmarks. And by the way, most of the time earmarks are used just to get people in the Appropriations Committee to agree on how they're going to split up the pie. Just to go through, a, we're going through a couple quick ones. No divided government and parliamentary system. First off, the American people don't want that. Every election they say they don't want that. They vote that way, they don't want that. They want divided government, and they think that's what works. The second thing is, it's illusory about parliamentary government. It looks good in the beginning if you just have two parties, and one party gets the majority, and then the prime minister gets to run everything. But take a look at parliamentary government around this country, around this world the last five years, and try to see how many governments have fallen and how difficult it is to get a government together because you've got divided government. It's not divided between two parties. It's divided between two, five, seven, ten parties. Just look at the Knesset sometime if you want to see how parliamentary systems lead to divided, uh, uh, you know, lead to uh, uh, intransigence and not ability to get things done. Uh, ragging on the press and the way it covers policy issues is one of my pet peeves. So I'm sorry I can't spend more time on it than then we'll be able to. But let me, I mean, First Amendment norms, of course, make it impossible to say anything more than uh, the press has got to, to reach its own level. Uh, the reporting is awful. There have been lots of studies done that show the, the proclivities of the press in covering issues to quickly, they may run a couple of early stories about the substance of what's going on early on when nobody's paying attention. But as soon as people are paying attention, they, re they report it as a campaign, a, a horse race who's winning, who's losing. It's very difficult to get information in that kind of environment that doesn't just exacerbate the attitude that people have that everything in, in uh, Washington is essentially a political game, and it's not about the underlying issues uh, that are at stake and that are being debated. One of the reasons we have such massive fights in Congress um, isn't because people just love to fight, but because of there are these fundamental differences in orientation about what federal policy should be on a whole range of issues, whether it's uh, the debt ceiling or the fiscal cliff or uh, too big to fail in the banks, you name it, and there are just huge disagreements. Those fights go on often in a reporting environment in which all you're learning about is um, what the leadership is doing to prevent some vote from coming to the floor or what games the president is playing to try to uh, cobble together something uh, on his side without any attention uh, to any kind of in-depth reporting. This is made worse by the advent of this phenomenon. It's made worse by the advent of cable news first and then Internet news, where more and more the phenomenon is not broadcasting but narrowcasting. We, we watch the kind of news that reinforces our current attitudes about uh, what's going on. Um, now we've got MSNBC on the left and Fox on the right. Lots of people just they zero in on one or the other of those two channels, and you can replicate that phenomenon on the web uh, dozens of times over. So it's, and then and then because of the again getting it back to the geographical sorting, even in our communities, we're often talking to people of like mind. We're not we're not uh, 
getting into a frame of mind where you're considering uh, that there's a legitimate alternative out there that has to be acknowledged as, as, as either a possible option or something you ought to negotiate with. If you've, if you've demonized your opponent, the idea that you should compromise your position to come a little bit closer to the demon uh, isn't, isn't a very attractive policy. If you think if you think there's a genuine, reasonable dispute and you ought to try some way to accommodate both interests, then you're much more, interested, much more likely to find a compromised view. One more, one, I think one last thing, and that is uh, my personal favorite, because I just hear it from everybody, and, and no one's raised it, but that's, you know, can't cover it, and that is that all members of Congress care about is their reelection. Um, I mean, that is where I go, where I talk to people, it's, it's uniformly felt that is the number one thing. And if you look at the way the press is coverage to follow up and what Chris said, the coverage of the press is, I mean, John Boehner never did a single thing in his life that wasn't directed towards winning the Republicans in the, in the House of Representatives. No member of Congress ever did anything for any other reason except to worry about their reelection. Uh, uh, it's just, it, 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 I just see it everywhere. And I just, it's just not what I believe uh, is going on. And the ba my basic argument is this. I asked the students, and I asked the students here, how many people think United States senators have a big ego? How many people think the United States senators don't have a big ego? And that's nothing bad. I mean, look, CEOs have big egos. You know, even college professors have some big egos. Anybody, I, my basic experience, anybody, just about anybody that's really accomplished has an ego. They, you have to, to go out and face the slings and arrows of outraged fortune. You've got to have a certain kind of an ego. So members, I'll stipulate the fact that if you believe senators have uh, an ego, then you have to believe, in order for they to care about re-election, that sen uh, someone runs for the United States Senate, goes to all the trial and tribulations of raising money, kissing babies, going to the state fair, all those things, gets elected, shows up for work, sits down at his desk and settles his staff, bring me the polling data because I want to know how to vote on each one of these issues so that I can get re-elected. It just doesn't, it, it, it defies it defies uh, uh, belief. And the final piece I'll give is in defense of the, our President of the United States, but I could do it about any of the Presidents of the United States, in my opinion. They do it because they're concerned about principles. They want to do something. You may not agree with what is. But I, one of the great things I had a chance to do was sit on the transition with uh, President Obama right after he was elected uh, when he decided what he was going to be doing about personnel and about um, uh, policy. And we'd always sit down, who's going to be Secretary of State, who's going to be Secretary of Treasury. There were like 10 people in a room. I, I came, not because of me, but because of the, I came with the, the Vice President-elect Biden. And so we had the first discussion. We talked about the, the, the positions and then uh, said, well, what issues are we going to deal with? And everybody said, well, we've got to do something about a stimulus bill. We've got to do something about the economy. We've got to do something about jobs. And the President-elect said, and we've got to do something about health care reform. And the room went silent. I mean, three of the people in the room had been big players in the, in the, in the uh, Clinton administration, Rahm Emanuel, John Podesta, and Jim Messina, and they look at him like, what? You want to do health care reform? Haven't you seen the history of what happens with people that do health care reform? But everybody's kind of quiet. So we had the second meeting. We came back and went through the same thing, and the president like, said, we're going to do health care reform. This is like a shaggy dog story. But he actually did. And everybody said, he's really serious about this. And we had the third meeting, he said he was going to do it, and everybody said, okay, we're going to do health care reform. But everybody said, you've got to be brain dead to do it, politically, to do health care reform in your first term. Do it in your second term. And you know what the president-elect said? I know about second terms. There's no chance you get anything as big as health care reform passed in your second term. The only way you can get it passed is in your first term. So you've got to decide what you're going to do during your honeymoon. I was there. That's what Barack Obama said. And you know what he said? He said, I don't want to leave the presidency after four years or eight years and have 35 million Americans not have health insurance. Now, I don't think most of the senators I met are like Barack Obama in that regard. They run for it and they do the rest of the things they're going to do because they really care and they really want to make a difference. A lot of them don't agree with me on what they're doing. Republicans. Uh, 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 a lot of Republicans I don't agree with. But, uh, no, it's really true. But I respect them. And they're running for the right reasons. And they really, really care with the vast majority making a difference. Now, some of them are the higher profile people. It's a little more questionable. Well, I think also, too, at the other end of the spectrum, if, you know, and those of us who've taken the class, uh, those of you who've taken the class know we kind of start out this way. Any, anybody here think they might want to run for office someday? Okay, well, more than one, that's good. Um, you know, think about it in your own terms. Uh, why would you want to run? Why would you want to uh, be reelected? Why would you want to be in office? Why do you want to do it? It's probably not because... Uh, you simply, uh, yeah, you're going to have a big ego to do it for the reasons Ted said, but it's probably because you care about a public policy or a series of public policies and you want to make a difference. 
And the same people, uh, you know, who are elected today and serve as members of Congress, I think the far majority of them started with that same uh, thought process and still have that same thought process. Uh, there are policies they care about and laws uh, they want to influence uh, and laws they want to change. And um, yes, they care about re-election. Most people care about re-election, but the notion that uh, their entire day from beginning to end is focused only on that, I think, is a is a widespread misperception as opposed to the reality. So let me just uh, leave you with a concluding thought, which is um, I think one of the, the characteristics of the Congress is both its uh, single uh, most attractive feature for uh, a constitutional democracy and the source of a lot of the ammunition that people have for being disgusted about it, and that's that it operates out in the open. It's the most transparent of the three branches of government. Think about how much you know about the internal workings of the Supreme Court. Think, aside from um, accounts, insider accounts that people like Senator Coffin can provide, think about what you know about the internal workings of decisions that are being made uh, in the presidential uh, chambers, the White House, and compare that to just how transparent and open Congress is. The reason there are lots of stories about Congress fighting is that policy is important to the people that work up there, and they have strong disagreements, and they express them, and you can see it all. You can, it's the best beat. Any, any reporter up in Washington who covers domestic politics would tell you it's a much better beat than the White House, where you're controlled and ushered into the White House press corps holding pen and given limited opportunities to talk to anybody who knows anything. Everybody's on this, got the same talking points. They're on the same script. It's really laborious to try to get anything uh, that everybody else doesn't have. Go up on Capitol Hill, you can corral a senator or a congressman just about any time you want. And uh, the, you could always find one who's willing to give you uh, a sense of what's on his or her mind in a very candid way. That makes it great for reporting. The kind of reporting that gets done, uh, a lot of good analysis has shown we're really, as a people, we're really fond of democracy. And we're really not too happy with the way fights and disagreements and delays and stalemates and procedures seem to be a necessary part of that. So we, we kind of associate our bad feelings oftentimes with the procedural aspects, the conflicts, the partisan bickering, the, uh, the, the looking at C-SPAN and seeing nobody on the floor of the House or the Senate and uh, quorum calls going on and all of that. Um, which is how the institution functions. And that can translate, a lot of good studies show, into having very low regard for the institutions. If you look at the rankings, the court, the president, and the Congress are almost always in that order in people's uh, estimation of how well they think our institutions are working. Part of the reason for that is the institution's greater strength. It's, it's less the people's house than it was 40 years ago when you literally could walk any place without the only reason you would run into a Capitol Hill policeman is to ask them where to find somebody, not to have them brace you up for identification and sent you through, uh, through metal detectors as they do now. But it's still by far the most open of the three institutions. That's got to be one of its biggest strengths, but it's also got to be one of the reasons that there are a lot of great stories about how poorly it's working. So thanks for coming, and uh, we'll, see you, uh, we'll see you soon with another program. <laughs>